I was just talking to, to Chuck. Uh, how many of you or your parents went to Berkeley? Let's try that. So my parents met at Berkeley. They met, uh, they immigrated to this country. They met as graduate students. My father studied physics. He was getting his doctorate. My mother was studying math and statistics. Uh, and so my brother was named after the Lawrence Observatory. Uh, we used to joke that my parents got busy there, but I'm sure they did not because they're, they're very sedate Taiwanese grad students. Uh, and then uh, my father got a job at GE in Schenectady, New York, where I was born. So I was born in Schenectady, it's upstate, it's about three hours north of New York City. Uh, and then my father moved to IBM when I was four or so. So I grew up in a neighborhood that frankly did not have many Asians at all in it. But I feel like I was sort of an accidental East Coast Asian because my parents actually loved this area. They met at Berkeley and they wanted to stay here. But then my father just uh, didn't find a job that he wanted here in the Bay Area. So my brother was so taken with the fact that he was born here that he actually came back uh, here for school at Berkeley. So Berkeley is very much the family school. It's where my, my parents met. Uh, it's where my brother was born. So we spent a lot, a lot of time here. And I have to say, where you all are growing up is singular. This is like not like most of the country. I hope you know that. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, so I'm, I'm looking at you all. You're high school, like sophomores, juniors. Go ahead, shout it out, because I, I want to get a sense. Freshmen, junior. I find myself asking, like, how do they get you here? <laughs> Was there some kind of inducement? Sort of, <laughs> I prefer not to say, that's funny. <laughs> some sort of academic credit, I can sense it. <laughs> oh, it's, it's true, it's, it's like a Saturday afternoon. <laughs> These kids are here, they're like captive. So, um, I get it. So I, I grew up, uh, my parents were very, very uh, into school. I went to Chinese school on Saturdays. Um, and then uh, I was told, just, do well in school, get good grades. So I went to Brown University, uh, studied economics and political science. I went to law school at Columbia. And then I was a corporate attorney in New York doing mergers and acquisitions and banking transactions. Very fancy sounding. Uh, but it was a really crummy job, um, I thought. So I went home to my parents and said, this is not the job you, you raised me to do. And my parents were like, what are you talking about? It's a great job, because it was a very fancy job. They'd been bragging uh, to their friends about how their, their son had this very fancy job. And I was like, no, this is really not a good job. <laughs> and so I left to start a company. And I was about 25 years old. How many of you are thinking you want to be entrepreneurs, uh, the young people here? So you should at least pretend and raise your hands. <laughs> oh. So, so uh, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I did not know this when I was your age. I was just like, I'm gonna do well in school, I'm gonna kick butt, I'm gonna get a good job. And then what happened to me is you get the good job and it turns out it's not a good job. And then Sanjeev knows what I'm talking about and other people don't talk. Sanjeev went and started his own company. And one of the things my dad said to me, so my father generated 69 US patents for GE and IBM. And he would come home, I remember this vividly, I was, at, I was about your age, I was in high school. And my father would be angry because he said that his managers were uh, people that couldn't invent anything. And so what happens is if you're in the lab and you couldn't invent anything, this is according to my dad, um, you became a manager. <laughs> and so what happened was all of the white guys were the managers and all of the uh, Chinese guys were actually inventing things. And he came back and he swore up and down. He was like, why are these guys bossing me around? Like they couldn't hack it in the lab. Why are they my bosses? <laughs> and I heard this and it really made an impression on me when I was your age. And I remember thinking to myself, if I can make it happen, I wanna have a career that does not depend upon someone else like approving or someone else signing off on me and my work. So that really stuck with me. And then when I was 25, 26 years old, I decided to start my own company. Now raise your hand if you've actually run your own company, because I know there are a few of you. Sanjay, you some of the other panelists, raise your hand. Um, so starting your own company is very, very hard. It's probably one of the reasons why some of you did not raise your hands just now, because you're like, hey, starting a company sounds super hard, and I have no idea what I would start. And that was my experience. I started this company in my 20s, and we raised about $250,000, which was a lot of money for a 25-year-old, 26-year-old, and we had this minimum mini rise, and then we failed. And everyone who knew me knew that my company had failed. My parents were pretending I was still a lawyer <laughs> at this time. They were like, oh, he's doing great. <laughs> um, but anyone who knew me knew that my company had gone out of business. 
But at that point then, I, I thought, well, I really want to be an entrepreneur. I liked it so much more. And so the way I became better as an entrepreneur is something I would encourage some of the young people here to think about, is I went to work for another entrepreneur. I went to work for someone like Sanjeev, and then I worked for that person for four years and learned what it was like to be a CEO. And then I became the CEO of a company that grew to become number one in the United States and was then acquired by a public company in 2009. So that was my business success, but I couldn't have gotten there if I had not started my own company, failed, worked for an entrepreneur, and then been made CEO. I was 31 when I was named CEO of this company. It was quite small, but then the company became pretty significant and was then bought by a big public company. So this is the time when I started doing things that I think BRI and CLUSA would really like. It was, it was 2009. I, my, my company was acquired and I made a lot of money, or like some money, you know, it felt like a lot of money. <laughs> this is before I had kids. You have kids and all of a sudden it's like, that wasn't as much money as I thought. <laughs> but, um, so I thought, well, what am I going to do to try and uh, solve the problems of the world? Because if you're an entrepreneur, and this is one thing I would encourage the young people here, you want to find something that you really want to fix. Like Sanjeev saw that there was some point of care issue in the healthcare industry and he said, you know what, I can improve that with my product. So the product, that, or the problem that motivated me at that time, and this is something that's relevant to you all, was that we had so much talent in the United States going to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and not very much going to Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, Alabama, Louisiana, like any of those places. Now some of those places, you've never been to any of those places. And it, it's cool, I had not been to those places either when I started Venture for America. So in 2011, I quit my job. I donated 120,000 to start a new nonprofit, a little bit like the people that donated money to start BRI or CLUSA. But Venture for America's purpose was to take smart young people, people very much like you all, and then train you to become entrepreneurs. Uh, and so what we did is we took you and then said, look, we'll train you and then we'll send you to work with an entrepreneur in a place like Detroit, New Orleans, Baltimore, Cleveland, St. Louis, and an, another 12 cities around the country. So I donated $120,000, and this is a trick. This is something you have to know if you want to start a business. You then have to start calling rich people, and then you ask them, do you love America? And then if they're smart, they say, what does it mean if I say yes? And then I say at least $10,000. And then 12 of them said, I love America for $10,000. So I raised 120 plus my 120, we had 240. And then it grew and grew and grew to the point where now my organization, Venture for America, has a budget of about six and a half to seven million. Uh, thousands of applicants, hundreds of fellows. We've created several thousand jobs around the country. Um, how many of you like documentaries? How many of you have a Netflix password? So there's a documentary with an Oscar-winning director about my organization that's now on Netflix. It's called Generation Startup, and I make appearances as like the Yoda figure or the Tim Gunn figure, depending upon your generation. So I then spent these seven years helping create hundreds of jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Missouri, Alabama, Louisiana. This was my big public service. Uh, I was honored by the Obama White House, so my wife and I got to meet the president. Um, this made my in-laws like me a lot for about a week. Um, and then I was invited as a, again to be an uh, ambassador of entrepreneurship for President Obama, so then I, I spent some more time with him. And, um, and so I was being celebrated for this public service work that I had done. But then Donald Trump became president in 2016. Um, and our community, I don't know how you all feel about Donald Trump. Like some of your parents voted for him, some, some of them did not. Um, I responded to Donald Trump's election with horror, honestly. I was like, well, this is an emblem to the accelerating decline of Western civilization. Uh, and I started digging into why Donald Trump won. And there are a bunch of explanations out there for why Donald Trump won. Um, and if you the, the, pay attention to the media, you've probably seen one of these. It's something like Russia, racism, Facebook, the FBI, like some combination of these things. But I dug into the numbers, and, and if you read my book, you'll see where I got the numbers. And the reason why Donald Trump is our president today is none of those things. The reason why Donald Trump is our president today is that we automated away 4 million 
manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Missouri, Wisconsin, Iowa, all swing states that Donald Trump needed to win and did win. How many of you have parents who work in technology or you work in technology yourselves? So my friends in technology know full well that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now doing to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and on and on through the economy. And that the reason why Donald Trump is our president today is that we are making it harder and harder for many American workers to find decent jobs and get ahead. So Donald Trump arrives on the scene, and who does he blame for this set of affairs? He blames immigrants. He says, it is the immigrants that are taking your jobs. We need to build a wall. We need to turn back time. We need to bring your jobs back. And that actually worked, even though a lot of the people that voted for him don't actually believe any of those things. Like, if you actually sit down with them and say, hey, is he bringing your jobs back? He's like, no, I know he's not going to bring my jobs back. Um, but they still voted for him. And I am here to say that all of this explanation is completely wrong that it is not immigrants, it is technology. And it has been said that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. <laughs> so instead of freezing time and trying to turn the clock backwards, which is what Donald Trump is suggesting, we need to turn the clock forwards. We need to accelerate American society so that it is able to manage what is the greatest economic and technological transition in the history of the world which is what we are in the midst of right now. And Sanjeev and my other friends are making that happen all the time. Like, we know it. Um, but the truth is that most Americans are not in position to benefit from it. And these problems are coming to the Chinese American community, the Asian American community in a particular way. And I, I, I want to delve into this a little bit. So most of us, most of our parents came to this country to make a good living for themselves and to provide a good life for you all. It's like the primary motivation, make a good living. It's one reason why many people in our community voted for Donald Trump, because they only care about one issue, which is their taxes. That if they can keep more money and make more money, it's all they care about, and everything else is marginal. Now traditionally, and one reason why something like CLUSA and BRI are so important, is that Asian Americans aren't traditionally that involved with American politics. We don't think it's actually something that's meant for us to succeed in. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. The politicians feel the same way. The politicians do not look at Asian Americans and say like, oh, really got to like win the Asian Americans over. Most politicians do not care about our community. Now there are a few reasons for this and it's all mutually reinforcing. So there are some very, very good reasons why if I was a politician, I do not need to care about the Asian American community. Number one is that the Asian American community is divided. And so you don't really need to care that much because they're gonna fall into each camp and so you can't like, get that much to, to one side or the other. Number two, we vote at lower levels than other groups. Number three, we donate at lower levels than other groups. Number four, we run for office at lower levels than other groups. So if you're a politician and you're at all rational, you think like I do not need to worry that much about Asian Americans. They're not gonna become a difference maker for me. Now, I'm happy to say that this is starting to change and we need it to change as fast as possible. Uh, and the re there, there are many reasons for it, but I'm going to lay out the one that I'm most concerned about. So uh, I have two young children who are younger than you all who are six and three. Uh, so they're both uh, Asian American. They're going to grow up in this country just like you. Now, the United States of America is projected to become majority non-white in 2045. And here in California, that's perfectly normal because I think you all are a majority non-white already, right? We're close to it? Maybe not, actually I saw the stats. Well, what percentage of uh, California is Asian American? It's about 15%, so I, like the last stat I found. Um, so it, it's probably not quite at a point where it's majority because like then the stats I saw from 2015 were that Asian Americans are about 15% here about 50% of Berkeley, I know, in like UCLA. <laughs> but 15% um, but of the population. Um, African Americans are about 7%, and then Latinos are probably around 15%. So you're looking at, so the state's still, let's call it like 
65 to 70% Caucasian. Now, this country is projected to become majority minority in 2045, which is 26 years from now. Uh, and be, that's because Asian Americans, the fastest growing uh, minority group in the country, so we're gonna go up from our current 5.6% nationally, up and up, so let's call it like nine or 10. Latinos also growing very quickly. Now, there was this happy dream that we've had for a number of years that as America becomes more diverse, it will also become more racially tolerant, that we would like get along better. Unfortunately, recent events have led us to, to see that that was just a dream. And then unfortunately, if you look at world history, when a dominant ethnic group loses its dominance and becomes insecure and threatened, it tends to become more racist, not less. Now let's say at the same time you were also to get rid of the most common jobs in that country. Let's call one of them truck driving. Driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states in the United States of America. There are three and a half million truck drivers. Three and a half million truck drivers. 94% of them are men. Average age is 49. They make $46,000 a year. The average education is high school. Now let's say you were to work in Silicon Valley and work on trucks that can drive themselves. There are very, very good reasons to do that. Uh, you will save $168 billion a year if you can automate away truckers. Now imagine if you were a trucker or a group of truckers or you were living in one of these communities where trucking is one of the major jobs and then you all of a sudden were competing with robot trucks that could drive themselves, that never stop. What do you think your next step is going to be? Who are you going to blame? Who is to blame for the fact that now you no longer have a job that supports your family? And I'm going to suggest that the, the truck driver population overlaps very heavily with the gun owner population. There are 300 million firearms in this country, almost one for every man, woman, and child. This is the most heavily armed society in the history of the world. Now, who is Donald Trump presenting as the boogeyman, the adversary, the antagonist? Who is our global rival now, according to Washington? China, that is right. And most Americans cannot tell the difference between Chinese, Chinese American, or Asian American. That is the truth. Now, you all might have seen that uh, the CFO of Huawei was recently imprisoned in Vancouver. And I'm going to suggest to you all that that would only have happened to a Chinese company. That if China had arrested Sheryl Sandberg in Hong Kong for doing business with Tibet, that would be an international incident of the highest order. That would be front page news here in the US until Sheryl Sandberg was freed. Am I right? Now why is it that the US imprisoned the CFO of Huawei, one of the biggest technology companies in China, in Vancouver, where she was speaking, and the US press, zero. The US press is looking at it being like, I guess that's okay. And why is that okay? Because she's Chinese. That had been any other country, there would be a daily story on this. But because it's China, nearly zero. So this is the place we are in right now as a community. This is like a, the hard truth. And I'm running for president. I am the first Asian American to run for president uh, as a Democrat in the nation's history. Um, but I'm running. <laughs> That's my ringtone. <laughs> I'm running to help explain to the American people why their communities are going into distress. It is not immigrants, it is technology. We need to advance society as quickly as possible. And I, I'm going to, to say that the time of us sitting on the sidelines has to be behind us. That we do need to step up and we have to show people that we are just as American as anyone else. We are just as patriotic, we are just as smart, just as innovative, and we love our children just as much. And now we're at the cusp of an historic opportunity that you all are at the center of. So I talked before about how national politicians don't care that much about Asian Americans. And it's true, they don't. Trust me, I've been with them, get a couple drinks in them, and then they're just like, yeah. That's not something I think about. 
But things are changing right now for 2020 in one big way, and you are at the center of it. So Asian Americans, 5.8% of the population, population, give or take. Not enough to swing an election. We're, we're based in New York, California, Texas, states that uh, can't really swing the presidential election until this time. How many people are going to run for president as a Democrat in 2020? What did you just say? 431. 431? Wow, that's even more than I thought. Um, uh, other numbers? 20, 25, 96, 40. Um, well, right now, as I'm here, uh, there are eight, according to the New York Times, and that's before Biden, Bernie, Beto, Booker. Wow, I got a bunch of Bs there. Um, <laughs> And so we're going to get up to, let's call it 25. So one reason why the Asian American community can make an enormous difference this time is that the field is so fragmented. Where if you have 5% of the population in a field of 25, that's an enormous jumping off point. That's a huge head start. And the Democratic primary debates are in June of this year. And I want you all to think about turning on that TV and seeing Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Cory Booker, and Andrew Yang on that debate stage. How meaningful would that be to our community? And we can 100% make that happen. Like, we're, we're right there already, where the DNC has already said they're going to take, let's call it like the top 20 candidates. So making me one of the top 20 candidates should be like this. I'm already polling at 1% in Iowa, tied with Kirsten Gillibrand. And I'm heading back to Iowa from here. Uh, it's where I'm flying with my campaign manager, uh, this handsome gentleman, Zach, uh, to Iowa after I leave here. So number one, a fragmented field. So being Asian American, uh, actually having that base make a huge difference. Number two, and this is the, uh, this is the part that's relevant for you all. Um, now, you're all, some of you are studying politics. Some of you are like into this stuff. Why is it that people like me are always talking about Iowa and New Hampshire? Yeah. Primary, that's right. Well done, sir. I hope your civics teacher is here. Be like, yes, he was paying attention. So right, Iowa is the first caucus state that's going to vote on February 5th of 2020. And then New Hampshire is going to vote a week later, February 12th, 2020. And out of this field of 25 candidates, like 15 or 16 are going to get wiped out by Iowa and New Hampshire. So that's why everyone's paying attention to Iowa and New Hampshire. Because if you fall flat in those places, then, you, then you're out. Now, the order of states this year goes Iowa, where we're going this week, New Hampshire, Nevada, South Carolina, and then this is where it gets interesting, California. California's number five. Historically, California was like number 20. And frankly, no one cared about what happened in California because it was already decided by the time it got to you all. But this time, it's not going to be decided. This time, there are going to be about eight candidates left who are going to, cal going to come to California and fight it out for the nomination. And now, if you have 15% of the voting population of California, and that's a huge determinant of who wins California and who becomes president. This is the first time in our nation's history that Asian Americans are going to get to choose who becomes president of the United States just based upon voting. Woo. You even have early voting that starts the same day as the Iowa caucus. So it's legitimately the case that Californians will be the first people to vote on who becomes president. Now, people are just now figuring this out, but that this time Asian Americans can really make their voices heard. And one of the things I say is that one of the reasons why politicians and the press don't care about Asian Americans is that we don't live in Iowa and New Hampshire. You know what I mean? If, if Asians were like 20% of, <laughs> of, of New Hampshire, it'd be a very, very different picture. But you are 15% of California, and California, the race is still going to be very much like fast and furious by the time it comes here to California next February. And then the third reason why Asian Americans can make a huge difference in, in this election is that 
uh, right now the Democratic Party is looking for new blood, new leadership, and I believe that it needs our point of view this time right now because most of the politicians don't understand technology, they don't even understand the economy, and they're trying to, to solve the problems of the 21st century with solutions from the past. So we have to help drag them forward. We have to show them that it is not immigrants that are causing their problems. It is the fact that the economy is evolving, that we can contribute and lead at the very highest levels of this society and show that we can, we, that we are just as American, just as innovative, just as patriotic, and that we can lead at the highest levels of this country.